eighth graders, we're continuing with our book Into the Clouds. I'm on page 144, and I'm going to start uh, kind of at the top of the page, uh, first paragraph. In the late afternoon of June 19th, after a final 12 mile slog up the Godwin Austin Glacier, the porters set down their loads for good. Underfoot was a jumble of jagged black rock. Overhead rose the snow dusted ridges of K2. The expedition had arrived at base camp. The climbers had gotten their first glimpse of the mountain that morning at a spot called Concordia, where two giant glaciers combine into one. In front of them to the north, giant walls of rock and ice rose from the ground and disappeared behind a bank of clouds. Higher up, impossibly high it seemed, the summit floated above the clouds. A mile long trail of snow and ice crystals blew from the peak like a giant banner. Nearly every climber who has stood on this spot has felt paralyzed by the sight. Nothing on the whole planet matches it, one wrote. Bob Craig stared at the giant plume of snow trailing from the peak and wondered what the wind up there would do to a man. He thought the mountain looked impossible to climb. Dee Molinar was struggling for breath at this point, trying his best to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Looks very steep and rugged, was all he could manage when he sat down with his diary that night. That evening, the temperature plummeted and snow began to fall. Pete Schoenig's fingers went numb as he tried to write to his parents. The climbers worried about the porters with their bare feet and thin clothes. Tony Streether offered up tea, warm food, and a two-person tent for a couple of especially weak-looking men. Six porters piled into the tent. The rest built low walls of stone to block the wind. They huddled under blankets and tarps and somehow survived the night. The next day, Streether paid the porters and they trudged down the glacier toward home. He was relieved to see them go after two weeks of constant negotiation. As the last porter faded from view, base camp grew quiet. Fifteen men were left standing in a sea of crates, eight climbers, six high-altitude porters, and a Pakistani official named Mohammed Ataullah, who would be in charge of base camp during their time on the mountain. The men had food for 70 days. The porters would return in 50. Until then, K2 was their home and their nearest neighbor was 100 miles away. On the morning, uh, we're beginning chapter 13, Ghost of K2, and this is a picture of K2, uh, a view of K2 uh, from the base camp. On the morning of June 21st, a second here, I want to make sure I've got this right. Um, on the, there we go. On the morning of June 21st, Charlie Houston watched eight men set off, set off up the glacier with 25 to 40 pound loads on their backs. The supply train was underway. One camp at a time, they would move up the mountain, leaving each tiny haven stocked with food, stoves, sleeping bags, and tents. The plan was to get 250 pounds of supplies to 25,000 feet, enough to get eight men through two weeks. Then they would stock one more camp with a single tent and supplies for a summit team of two. They would not, Houston had vowed many times over, repeat Wisner's mistakes. His team would climb together, or not at all. No advance party would get too far ahead of the supplies. They made steady progress in the first couple of weeks. The work was hard, but the weather held. Some days the sun turned the snow to slush. They took turns breaking trail and sunk to their knees with every step. Other days, the wind blew cold and fierce. 
forcing them to kick steps in the crust with their crampons. To Houston, the steady march up the mountain was both thrilling and frightening. It felt so final every time they packed their sleeping bags and stoves and broke trail for a new camp. His wife, Dorcas, and the kids and everything familiar faded further into the distance. One camp after another, they traded the known for the unknown. Along the way, each of the men responded differently to the altitude. Molinar was the hardest hit. His muscles ached, his head throbbed, and he had no desire to eat. Gilkey and Houston had headaches. Craig was a little moody. Strether felt fine now that the porters were gone. Bates was his usual cheerful self, and Shonen looked strong and eager to work. Bell was unflappable. He acted like he'd just been out for a hike in the park. No one knew exactly how he was going to react as he climbed, but since the 1939 expedition, a lot had been learned about what happens to the body at altitude. Houston himself had spent the war studying how fighter pilots reacted to high altitude flights. He knew that the body adjusts as it climbs. Red blood cells increase to make up for the lack of oxygen in each breath. The Everest expedition had helped, had help from bottled oxygen on the highest slopes. Hillary and Norgay had strapped tanks to their backs and breathed air that felt as rich as it did at sea level. Houston had decided against the artificial help. Hauling oxygen tanks to K2 would requ have required a much bigger expedition. And oxygen-aided climbers didn't acclimatize as well as they would on their own. If the tanks failed on a final summit push, the consequences could be fatal. As Houston's team climbed to the highest reaches of K2, they would breathe the air the mountain had to offer. They would acclimatize in stages. A couple of days of misery followed by relief, then misery again. At some point, 25,000 feet for some, lower for others, there would be nothing but a slow decline. As Jack Durant had discovered in 1939, in the Himalaya, you never fully recover. On June 28th, with Camp One fully stocked, Houston, Craig, and Bell clambered up a steep slope of loose rock, searching for the old Camp Two. After a couple of hours climb, they came across a nearly level piece of ground that looked as though a garbage can had been overturned on it. A few cans of jam and pemmican lay scattered in the snow, hardly rusted at all. Nearby was a stove, a five pound can of Ovaltine and a rumpled Logan tent. At their feet were the first reminders of Wisner's doomed expedition. Not that Charlie Houston needed reminding. He knew they would be climbing in the footsteps of Dudley Wolf and Pasang Kakuli. It was an eerie thought. No one had set foot on K2 since Durant and Wisner gave up on their lost friends and limped off the mountain. And the Himalaya preserves its history in gruesome ways. George Mallory, who nearly made it to the top of Everest in 1924, was found 75 years later at 27,000 feet, a name tag still readable on his flannel shirt. At the newly found Camp Two, Houston, Craig, and Bill couldn't resist pitching the Logan tent and piling in. Was it here, inside the same canvas walls, that Wisner had shivered through the night with Basang Lama after leaving Wolf at Camp Seven? And if the mountain had preserved a tent untouched for 14 years, what else? might lay hidden on the slopes. Houston knew that in the days to come, he could cross the base of a gully or crest, a plateau, and find the body of his friend, Basang Kakuli, frozen stiff in the snow. I'm gonna stop there and midway through, page 151, pick it back up next time. Thank you so much, ninth grade. Take care.